as you can see on the screen, I want to talk about intentional faith development. Uh, a series that we've been talking about cultivating fruitfulness or what it means to be a fruitful church. And this is the middle of the series, a five-part series, as you know. Last, the very first, we start off with extravagant hospitality. What does it mean to be a church that makes anyone and everyone not just feel like they're tolerated, not just feel like they are welcome, but who make everyone feel like family, that go above and beyond and are incredibly extravagant in their hospitality. And then the second of the series uh, we saw was passionate worship. You know, last week we talked about what it meant to worship a God in a way that was filled with the spirit, not just route, not just coming and showing up, and, but really engaging, really thinking about, really being animated about the presence of the Spirit in the exploration of glorifying God, worshiping, not just on Sundays, but every day and everything we do. And today, I want to talk about intentional faith development. I love the adjectives that we attach to these things. Um, you know, anyone who's a Christian will tell you faith development is important, right? To, to become growing in your faith. But there has to be an intentionality about it. So as we look at this, as we talk about what this is, we need to move to what this really means. And what this really means, what this intentional faith development is centered on is that we don't have any apostles today to just you know follow their teachings in the sense that they're living in our lives. But what we do have is the word of God as given to us through the apostles in scripture. And I've got to tell you, when we really start to live into scripture, when we start to <clears throat> open it up and look at it and not just study it, but really unpack it, I love the phrase, scripture will mess with your life when you do intentional faith development. And it all comes back to a word that I know I've mentioned before here, and I'll keep mentioning, and it's praxis. It's a really neat little word. Um, and I didn't hear it till I got to seminary. But praxis means actually putting the idea into practice, putting our faith into something that is tangible and in action. You know, I love the line that I used to do with my kids, and this is the thing, faith in action is trusting in God is not a spectator sport. And the idea of praxis means that the scripture is more than what we talk about. You know, I will keep talking about the failing of the English language, not because English is such a bad language, but sometimes when you translate it, we lose a lot in the translation. You know, we look at this passage that we've read today, and it says, it's simple, right? They, what, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Now, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings is often taken, it's misinterpreted. We lose in the translation the idea that this just means we sit down and study the word of God. Now, the study of the word of God is really, really important. But the study of the word of God is only part of what this scripture is talking about. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. It means they studied it and then they did something with it, and they studied it, and they studied it together. They studied it together because when we study together, when we do it outside of individual Bible study, which I've got to tell you is very important, it's very necessary, it's a way to feed yourself, it's a way to grow, but when you study with others, and you unpack scripture with others, something 
supernatural happens. You get new perspectives because my perspective on the scripture is very different from Cliff's or Anne's or Antonella's. You know, I'm a middle-aged Asian man who grew up in the States who was an immigrant. That shapes how I read scripture. I think Reverend Anne's, you know, template is a little different than mine. You know, she's not the same gender. She's white. She grew up in different places and had different life experiences. So she sees differently, but when we do it together, the scripture becomes richer. You know, just like Cliff and Ron and Ken and so many others bring different things in in that conversation. But more than that, as we have that conversation together, as we go on that faith journey, as we intentionally grow our faith together, something else happens that faith and the practice of the faith becomes stronger. For me, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who's one of my heroes, uh, you may know him, I'm not gonna get into his history too much, except he was a Christian martyr. Um, he returned to Germany to put it, his faith into action and he did it and he could do it because of the community of faith that grew around the study. Dietrich Bonhoeffer reminds us that and incom incomparable joy results from the physical presence of other Christians. And that's what the, I think the most difficult thing of COVID is, is that we're not physically present, but we can be at least virtually present. Because he puts it this way, we see in the companionship of a fellow Christian, a physical sign of the gracious presence of Christ. He talks about this in his book, Life, Life Together. But what, what, why this is important is that in that working together, of unpacking scripture together, of looking at what God is calling us to get to do together because of scripture, putting that faith into action and principally developing our faith together, we start to train ourselves. But in that training, it's so much easier to do with someone else. You know, researchers have found you can lose weight better if you do it with someone else. You can quit smoking easier if you do it with someone else. You can grow in whatever endeavor you do if you have a companion. That's why when I went to ranger school, which is kind of the least fun I've ever had in my whole life for an extended period of time, it's like 60 days of torture. They just torture you. I survived because of my ranger buddy. They pair you up because it's easier when you do it in community and it's deeper and richer, this intentional faith development when you do it together, even if it's only one or two other people. So let's talk about the how. How do we intentionally develop our faith? It's both simple and profound. And like I said, simple doesn't mean easy though. Simple means we have to try different things. I mean, traditionally there are Sunday school, there are Bible studies, which we'll do, but there are other things, other ways that we can approach it and we've got to experiment. And I love this picture, okay? I love this picture because any scientist will tell you, it's sometimes, when you experiment, you fail, but you learn more often from your failures than your successes if you look, examine them. So we experiment, we get things wrong, but we get things right too. We just keep doing it till we get it right. But in the doing it, in the getting it wrong, we also learn, we also grow. You know, my favorite sport, and I'll talk about this again and again, is baseball. I love baseball because it's a sport of failure. It's the only sport where if you get it right three out of 10 times, you're a hall of fame hitter. It's the only sport where learning how to fail well is good. In fact, that's life, isn't it? That's faith development. We experiment at the core, but at the core of this are small groups. And I'm not talking about small groups like our prepackaged small group ministries in our, you know, that you can buy off the shelf. And, but small groups like that are important, but I'm talking about small groups of believers who gather together to intentionally grow. 
that's things like our deacons, like our mission, missions team that I really had experience with. It's at the core of small groups, intentional faith development through small groups are two or three or four people or more gathering together to share their lives, to share God in a new and practical way, to put the scripture that we're learning into practice, into healing lives, into saving, you know, souls and saving bodies. You know, one of the best good news stories I read about the other day was the move uh, by police and law enforcement to rescue human traffic children. I mean, that's faith in action. It's us pushing. And we have a lot of very good opportunities to do this. God will send us, but my, my, my hope for you today is, like I said, I'll always leave with a challenge, is to work to grow and look and see how we can grow in faith. And I'll take any suggestions that you offer to us as a church, as church leadership, on how we can help you grow in your faith. We'll offer lots of opportunities, lots of ways to study, but also lots of ways to apply that faith into action. Even the Bible study during Lent will have an action component to it. I got to warn you, I will challenge you after the conclusion of every Bible study, not just to do your homework, but then do some work to do something during Lent to move God's kingdom forward, especially in this time of COVID. Our charge isn't just merely to open the Bible, though that's important. It's to take that Bible, it's take those words, it's take that teaching and make it real and tangible for the world around us. And when we do that, God will add to our numbers daily. Not only does the study of the word equip us to answer the questions that people pose, why are you a Christian? Why do you believe? Why do you waste your time on Sunday morning or during the week? But also respond, why are you here helping me when I need it? You know, one of my favorite stories is uh, about Mother Teresa putting praxis, faith into action. She was walking from her home to the mission center when she saw someone, something, in the gutter in the street in Calcutta. And it was a human being, an untouchable, covered in things that you don't even think about. She picked, her, she picked him up, brought him back to the mission, cleaned her with her own hands. And he said, this is the first time someone has seen me as a human being, why did you do it? And then she explained her faith to him. The theology of care to change a life. And he said, Throughout my life, I've been treated like less than a dog. And today, someone has seen me as a human being. This God must be pretty nice. And as he died, he died knowing God because of that faith. And with the faith, like to, like to think Mother Teresa did it all by herself because of the fortitude of her faith. But even she, would, in her writings and, and, and her inner talks, would talk about the community that supported her throughout this endeavor. Now, as we go into Black History Month in about a week, as we go into the, hopefully the end of COVID, as we go into all the challenges that life has, know that you are part of a community of faith that will walk with you. And it's a community of change, not just changing our community around us, but changing us too. Remember, the question is, what kind of disciples do we want to be at First Presbyterian Sina? And I think for me, as your pastor, as your new pastor, is I want us to be a change for our community that shines the light of hope, of love, by putting this faith that we're developing into action, into our everyday lives. So join me on this journey, help us explore, and know you are the chosen of God, his beloved. And 
as Max Lucado says so often, God loves us too much to leave us where we are. Let him move you. Let's pray. Oh, God of glory, God of grace, God of love, we thank you. In these interesting times, you provide for us. You provide others who walk with us, who hold us, who lift us up. Help us to develop our faith and deepen it and be enriched by it, Lord, today. And in your holy, wonderful, precious name we pray.